welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Gretsch and we are here uh, in the Keeping Your Business Alive During COVID-19 webinar series. Uh, it's been an extraordinary run. We're on to our ninth weekly presentation um, and it's a really special uh, honor today to be welcoming uh, my uh, good uh, friend of 20 years, Ellen Marchman, <laughs> someone who yeah, I first that. met yeah, through the, our work with Stacy Glassman uh, and many of the others, Lorencia and Lauren, uh, at the New World Symphony here in Miami. We, um, it was, we were the uh, kind of founding group uh, of the uh, Friends of New World Symphony. This is before Frank Gehry, when it was still uh, what is now an H&M. It was the old Lincoln Road uh, Theater. And it is, um, it's an amazing kind of full circle feeling to be able to welcome uh, my dear friend, uh, and see so many familiar names uh, in the chat. And by the way, guys, uh, we do have a group chat, and I really welcome you to use that throughout this um, presentation uh, to create interactivity and, and ask questions. Uh, Ellen has a really um, great but compressed presentation that is going to come alive with your questions. So uh, please uh, go ahead and um, send her your well wishes and, and any New World Symphony folks, go ahead and throw a, a quick shout out in the, in the chat uh, and we're gonna get started. So um, we have a, a number of amazing digital marketing related events uh, coming up. Uh, tomorrow I'm gonna be hosting um, a discussion with South Florida's top SEO person. His name is Joe Laratro. If you don't know what SEO is, it means search engine optimization. It's a series of techniques, both technical and content related to help get your website higher in the organic search rankings of Google. So search engine optimization is just a face, fancy way of saying getting your website to show up in Google search without you having to pay to send people to your site. That's SEO. Uh, Joe LaRatro from Tandem Interactive is going to be the speaker. Um, it's going to be a fabulous, hands-on, very useful presentation. The other quick plug about that is it's being sponsored by Safima, the South Florida Integrated Marketing Association. I'm a board member there. It's the top uh, professional marketers organization in South Florida, and we're putting on a lot of great events, and I'm very proud of my association with them. Uh, next in our BizHack Live series is Shanna Osterwitz of the Business Accelerator 1909 in Palm Beach. Shana is an expert in how to build a tribe for your business. And she's been doing this in her own startup and is part of the head of an accelerator. Uh, I'm telling you guys, you don't know about 1909 or Shana because she lives two counties away, but she should absolutely be someone you... Uh, can learn from and who has a deep expertise in how to build a tribe. And if you have a tribe, that tribe will see you through the hardest times. And so I'm really um, eager to learn from her uh, next week. After that, uh, for those of you who are familiar with BizHack, I'm bringing back uh, our master instructor, our longest standing lead instructor, Giovanni Insignaris, who works at the Related Group. He's going to be talking about Instagram Stories Ads 101. So Instagram Stories have blown up ever since Facebook copied Snapchat and integrated that functionality, the Snapchat functionality into the Instagram platform and then marketed it better than Snapchat. Um, so Instagram Stories have become a huge marketing tactic. And then to leverage advertising to just blow up your stories is what uh, Gio is going to be talking about. It's, he's very much on the pulse of the latest and, and greatest in digital marketing. And so this is going to be really a cutting edge session. And then I'm actually going to lead the first session I've done. I realized I've done this webinar series. I love speaking publicly, but I've never actually done a session in the series. So I'm going to actually host my own it's on my personal favorite topic, which is how to find your ideal target audience uh, on Facebook. And it'll be very interactive. This is a, I've done master classes uh, for the Idea Center that we've charged for, and this we're gonna give free to the community. Um, I gotta say that when it comes to digital marketing, 
while Gio is going to talk about what's the latest and the greatest in the technology and what's cutting edge, I'm going to be talking about what is the most important single foundation to successful social media marketing, which is audience identification. And I'm going to give you really concrete tips and tactics and tools for how to find your ideal target audience on Facebook. Um, so please uh, sign up for that. Um, all of these uh, are right now at our Eventbrite page. Um, and you can also, you'll get a follow-up email with links to RSVP. Uh, we already have several dozen folks for the next couple sessions, and I hope you join us for those. Um, so as many of you heard, uh, I started uh, 20 years ago in Miami. I was an intern at the Miami Herald, had just graduated from college, drove down in my ratty Dodge Neon, and I came here and did not realize that I was starting a life here, but I've been here essentially continuously for 20 years with a short trip to Argentina uh, where I studied journalism for two years. So for 18 years, I've lived in South Florida, and for most of that time, uh, I've been very active in the community, both as a journalist, uh, as a patron of the arts, um, as part of the New World Symphony, watching that organization grow and flower, um, and then uh, more recently as a business owner of BizHack Academy, which was named a top startup in 2019 by the Miami Herald. And I wanted to take a minute before we talk about conscious communication, which is the topic of today, um, to reflect back on, on a conversation that um, Ellen and I had in preparation for today, um, she really forced me to reflect on what BizHack has been doing and to the, ex the extent to which what BizHack has been doing with this webinar series is an example of and a case study in conscious communication. And I know that she's going to actually talk a little bit about this. Um, but I was, to kind of prepare those comments, um, I wanted to pull out five principles about what I have learned in the last two months by running this free community webinar series. And um, these are really kind of new thoughts, thoughts that have come really prompted by Ellen and, and what she's invited me to consider uh, and it's one of the reasons why, on a personal level, these webinars are so rewarding to me because I learn so much from them. So when COVID really started to hit in early March and things started shutting down and my daughter came, stayed home from school that first week before spring break, I, like everybody else, freaked out. And I freaked out because I was anxious about my parents, my daughter, myself, my family, and our health. But I also freaked out because it became really apparent that I wasn't gonna be able to run my in-person classes anytime soon. Revenue from a lot of my corporate clients got deferred or, or pushed back or postponed or canceled entirely. And I realized that my business was in danger, not just my health. And in that moment of vulnerability and fear, I decided with the support and on the advice of some of my advisors to launch this community webinar series. And I wanted to talk a little bit about why I did that and what I've learned from it as an example of conscious communication and to kind of set up what uh, Ellen is gonna be speaking to us about today. So the place that I started was I knew I wanted to give back. I knew I didn't have a lot of money, right? So the traditional way to give back is through charity. But I, I knew I didn't have money to give or meaningfully couldn't help people in that regard. I frankly had a, my own family to worry about and take care of. But what I did have was I, I knew and listened to what our audience of small business owners and marketing professionals needed. And we heard, we asked people in a survey and we read and analyzed those responses, and we identified a need around critical cutting edge information about how to market during a pandemic. Because the marketing behaviors of our audience had shifted fundamentally, and the channels to reach them had changed irrevocably almost overnight. So we identified a need in our target audience, in our business owner audience, that they needed to understand how to market 
themselves during a pandemic and when their business model and their audience had changed irrevocably. Now, how do I serve that need? Use your superpowers. I have nearly 20 years of broadcast experience in radio and TV. I am a expert communicator and storyteller. I have a master's degree in storytelling from FIU. The way I can best give back is to take my superpowers and apply them to the need that I've identified in my audience. So start by listening and identifying a need and then think, what is the one thing that you can do that nobody else can do to help serve that need? And that's where this webinar came from. It reminded me of both the days when I used to run uh, a radio show on WLRN and also the kinds of in-person sessions that I've been doing around town more than a hundred times in the last two years. So it kind of combined my broadcast and my teaching into a format that worked perfectly for my superpowers. Lead with the heart. As weeks have gone on and my anxiety has sort of leveled, I've put more and more of my honest and true and vulnerable self into these webinars. And I'm not trying to front or pretend we're more successful than we are. And I'm trying to talk in a way that is from the heart rather than the head. And this goes right into point four, which is give and don't expect in return. If you give with an open heart and without any expectation in return, that's when the true power comes from the gift that you're giving. And I believe when the true power from the loyalty and trust and transparency that you engender will pay off down the line. Maybe not immediately, we're all struggling, we're all suffering, we're all not in a position to uh, support my business. But if you do it without expecting anything, you come off genuinely and it becomes, I think, uh, much more powerful uh, as a marketing um, tactic and also just as a community service. And then finally, you can get lost in giving back if you're a business owner. And so the one piece that I would add that I didn't think about in the weeks one, two, and three, but my advisors started reminding me about is within the context of this giving back, don't forget that you're a business and that your lifeblood is cash. And so don't forget that it's okay to be running a business while giving back. If you follow one through four, when you get to five, people will understand and uh, even potentially come out wanting to support you. And so in that spirit, um, we have a course, uh, our five week accelerated course starting June 23rd. And there might be somebody you know who could really use an accelerated course in how to market their business in this context. And if so, please reach out to me personally. I'll take care of your people. Uh, I'll make sure they have a great experience. We're about halfway through our current five-week cohort, and I could be more proud of the kind of results we're starting to see. All right, that's my little sales pitch. Um, now, Ellen. Um, Ellen is uh, an extraordinary talent and somebody who um, has been a dear friend and well, also someone who I've admired for her PR prowess for a long time. She's gonna talk about communications tools to strengthen client longevity and foster business partnerships. She's gonna talk about how to grow mutually enriching relationships. There's that money idea again uh, in our new normal, uh, but money and spirituality, money and spirit. So I love that word enriching. And then conscious communication techniques specifically such as intentional communication, active listening and conflict resolution. Now. Um, Ellen has a beautiful dog, um, and she yeah. also... <laughs> she's she's coming in at the last 10 minutes, I'm sure, with her squeaky toy, so what, I'm what's, letting her... what's your dog's name? Luna. Luna. Is it a girl? It's a girl, yeah. All right. Beautiful. Uh, well, Luna um, is going to do a cameo, we hope. Um, <laughs> Ellen is a published writer with 20 plus years in the PR and communications industry, and she owns her own firm called Get Inc. PR. She is specialized in two industries that have been really hard hit, wellness and hospitality. Um, and uh, her specialty in crisis communications has really come in handy, I imagine. 
She's also been named as a woman of excellence by the National Association of Professional and Executive Women. Uh, Ellen, I'm, I'm sorry uh, that I took a little longer with this introduction, but you so inspired me to really think deeply about conscious communication that I just wanted to share some of the thoughts that I had about that before you begin your presentation. No, absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that those, the questions I was asking you prompted you to dig a little bit deeper, which is what this whole hour or 45 minutes will be. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who's joining. It's really fun to see so many friends and a little shout out to my dad, Herb Marchman's on, who um, is also my inspiration. He has always had my back and inspired me to just push further and actually inspired me to start my own firm, which was 15 years ago, started it in 2005, which gosh, I think I knew nothing at that point, so crazy. And, um, and ironically, the 15 year anniversary was in March and I was like, what can we do? Let's, let's throw a quinceanera, you know, let's do something really fun. And then that was March 15th and here we are. Um, so it has been for all of us a very, now that we can step back a little bit, for me, it's a very interesting case study of uh, the sink or swim analogy. And I think everyone that's on here has been swimming against the current, but at least we're swimming. And I feel that communications is currency. And so when you have strong client relationships and have trust and loyalty, that has always started with the way you communicate with them. So this, hour, 45 minutes, we're going to be breaking down the tools of how to consciously communicate during re-entry. Uh, going back a little bit for some hardships that I was enduring in, in March, again, uh, the majority of my clients are restaurants. And the sky was falling, the landscape was shifting every day. And so I was writing all of these materials for their guests of these are the you know, hygiene practices. This is what we do normally. You know, we're wiping everything down. So the first couple of weeks where the restaurants weren't shut down, we were re really working hard on these messaging, um, which had to have a conscious tone because you didn't want to scare the customer away. You wanted them to feel that you were taking care of them. And that began with very positive language. Uh, and then, Personally, I was at the same time negotiating these clients because the way that I work with clients is I have a retainer uh, for six months, a year. And of course, there's always a termination clause in there. So it was this delicate dance of how are you speaking with the client, understanding what they're going through, but also showing that they need you and that these are the solutions that you can be giving them. So I, half of them went ahead and froze the accounts, but we were able to do addendums where instead of severing the relationship, we would be able to come back with them when they open. And then uh, a couple of other clients decided to keep me on in full capacity for the beginning, which was amazing. And honestly, we worked <laughs> 24 seven because I was, you know, again, constantly changing landscape. Um, I was also set to start teaching uh, a professional writing course with many of us know uh, Mike Leekoff with Modern Ohm, and it was going to be a master level communications class where we would dig into your personal story and help you write your bio, or if you were launching a new project, write your uh, website copy or opening announcement for media. So clearly that's on hold. But because I'd been working on that, and I'd also been writing down tips and tools of what was working with my clients, the way that I was communicating with them, I was able to just kind of do a recipe of all of these ingredients that shifted me to here. And being able to present a more verbal conscious communications plan with Dan, and that starts with connection. And these next two weeks, I mean, I know I feel anxiety because we're not sure if things open, are they not open? Do we want to go? 
traffic is building up. Uh, you know, we're having to multitask more because clients are coming back, at least in my case. And so as we re-enter this new normal, I want us to continue to be cognizant of that connection that we had in the beginning where we were reaching out to others and asking how they were and picking up the phone and calling friends that we hadn't talked to in months and months. Um, and how do we do that with now you're juggling, you know, maybe you're needing to commute back to the office and you're facing traffic, but your kids are still home and you're having to homeschool. So how do you do that? How do you support your employees that are returning to work? How do you pursue new clients? And, and for some of us, there could be interviewing that you're going to need to start doing to supplement uh, whatever industry you might be in. So what I've found is that those that consciously communicate are happier. There's less stress and there's better business relationships. And there's a study that I found from the, it's called the Graduate Management Admissions Council. So it administers the GMAT business school exam. And they actually have uh, statistics of how these, those that communicate more consciously and with clarity and positivity are able to have a 25% increase in pay. Again, happier, less stress, uh, feeling much more empowered about what they're doing within personal and business relationships. So today we're gonna to talk through um, improving communication with clients, customers, employees, employers, team members. And if you're also bringing team members back and you're needing to train them of how to consciously communicate with your clients, I think there's gonna be some tips in here that, are, that will resonate with you. And they're all very simple and, and it, some of them bring us back to what did we learn as children? Uh, but uh, we're gonna start with intentional communication. Dan, if you wanna throw that slide up. Perfect. So that always starts with purpose. What is the purpose of this particular communication? What do you need in this communication? And then what do you want the other to understand and respond? Because again, it's, it's a, a team effort. It's not just you controlling the conversation because that usually doesn't uh, have the end result that you are hoping for. And this comes back to intention. Um, what does winning a conversation look like? Do you really want to win that conversation or dominate that conversation? Where having a back and forth where you have intent behind your communication, it helps resolve the issue and eliminate some of that defensiveness when we are in a, a disagreement with an employee or a client or a customer. Uh, and it helps the other feel genuinely heard. I mean, at the end of the day, don't we all want to be heard? That's, we all want to be heard. And that also extends to, we want to be valued. We value ourselves. We want others to value us. And we want to value other people. So that could be a real um, just snippet if you are doing a, a sales training with employees or um, if you're working with verbiage of clients, you know, with restaurants, like how are they now training their staff to interact with clients, especially when they're wearing masks. And so you're not able to see the facial expressions. So it really is going to reflect on how are you approaching the conversation and what are you saying? And that, what I feel is creates clarity. Clarity in conversation also begins with questions. So many times when we're having a very intense conversation or an important conversation, I like to paraphrase the question and repeat it back. So the individual knows that I'm understanding what they're saying. And if I'm misunderstanding what I'm, they are saying, it gives them a chance to clarify what they're hearing and what they're saying and vice versa. So for example, I could be having a conversation and say, I'm not sure quite what you mean. Can you tell me more about this? And then sit back and let them participate. And um, that 
then extends to body language. So pre-COVID, body language was about 80% of communication. And now that we're on Zoom or we're on conference calls or even when we're going to be having social distancing meetings, it's this communication has now tipped the scale. So using positive body language lets others know again that you're invested and you value them and you value the conversation. And be present. Um, no one, we all know when someone's multitasking on the phone because they, you can just feel the switch <laughs> to shift. So smile when you talk, if you're on the phone or you know here smiling because it also changes the voice inflection. And with so many sales teams, team members that are gonna be doing more conference calls than in-person meetings, or you know, team members who are on the floor of retail or our servers in restaurants, again, you're not gonna be able to see the facial expression, but you can hear the voice inflection. And, and I think that many of us take that for granted. And again, you know, and avoiding eye contact, multitasking, signals uh, disinterest or disregard, uh, blocks communication. Again, if you're having one-on-ones, you know, don't cross your arms. That's such a, a resting place for so many of us to cross our arms. But again, that, that is blocking the energy of positive and conscious communication. Um, and let's see if we can really break an old habit try not to take an important conference call in the car. We all do it. My friend Gianna calls it her phone booth. Uh, but if you're taking an, a, an important call, try not to do it in the car because you're gonna be multitasking. You're not gonna be really absorbing what the person is saying. It's gonna waste your time. It's gonna waste their time. And ultimately you're gonna have to ask questions that were already answered in the call. And um, then that leads to we had a yeah. couple questions, if it's okay yes. for me. So um, one point I'll just make really quickly is when you're on a video conference like this and you keep your video turned off, that gives you an opportunity to not pay attention. Um, and the speaker feels that. So one, not saying that you have to turn your video on, but definitely is part of conscious communication there is sort of a different set of rules around video conferencing than what we're used to, um, uh, you know, and, and what intentional communication looks like in a different platform. So um, Myra Concepcion uh, asked, what are some books you'd recommend on good communication? And Neha Verma asked, any advice for corporate communications, internal or external? There is a great book that I just read and I was going to reference in the, in the presentation and then it got scrapped on one of the many, many drafts that I had, but um, it's Malcolm, sorry, Loons, it's Malcolm Gladwell and he wrote Blink. And so it's called Talking to Strangers and he gives fascinating anecdotes. One is a Cuban spy. She works for uh, a, a division of the NSA, and she has been a Cuban spy for 20 years. And it's about how you interact with the person and how you also, you always want to believe the good because there's, he, he talks about this balance of having to have actual like negative data to believe the bad in a person for most of us. So I would say Talking with Strangers, great book. You can get on Amazon. And then um, for corporate communications, for internal or external, I've, we're going to have some takeaways that you will have. And then this deck that you're seeing is a really simple, concise training that will apply to both, both internal and external. Perfect. Did you want me to advance the slide? I'm gonna talk about energy really quick. Um, again, just going back to maintaining upbeat overall attitude, no matter what the conversation is, it gives assurance and belief that you are understanding what they're saying, you're supporting them and it strengthens your relationship. And 
You can even redirect a difficult conversation with positive, supportive responses. Again, they want to know you have their back. And if you have their back, most times they'll have yours. So yeah, go ahead and advance to active listening. Sorry, I'm just looking at the chats real quick to make sure I didn't leave off anything. Okay, so with active listening, it's perhaps the most critical component of effective communication. And it's one that many of us take for granted. So when we, again, feel dismissed, unimportant, ignored, we, our body recognizes these as threats, which then acts, activates our defense mechanisms. Um, we get short. We, we, you can feel like you, you got a little pressure on your chest. You're, you're not breathing. <laughs> oh. And if you're not genuinely listening to one another, everyone's going to stop listening. They'll stop listening to you. And again, as I was saying, we all want to be heard. So active listening, in a nutshell, is a way of being intentionally present. And that starts with not multitasking, <laughs> especially when you are, you're on deadline for our journalists or our writers or you know, a client is needing information and say your team member calls or someone pops into your office, it's so important to stop what you're doing and really focus and have a genuine conversation because if you're multitasking and having the conversation, I'm telling you, it's gonna double the amount of time you're gonna to need to spend on that particular conversation. So stop, you have five minutes, you really do. Maybe it's only two. But if you are, you know, working on a crisis management and you are behind the gun, just be honest, be transparent and say, I am so sorry, I've got to get this out the door. Can we meet in five? Or if a person calls you, many times I will pick up the phone when I'm in the middle of something and be like, I just wanted you to know that I, I, I'm here, but I've got to call you back in a couple of minutes versus taking that call and being like out of breath or being short, that is, it's, it's doesn't do anyone any good and you're never going to resolve whatever the reason was that that person came in or called you. So, Ellen, yeah. I have trouble with this personally. I think one is I don't want to disappoint the other person and they're on a timeline, I'm on a different timeline. Uh, and two is I think I do sometimes uh, oh, underestimate how long things will take or overestimate or underestimate how busy I am. Um, do you tend to under promise and over deliver? How do you manage, you know, our desire to please others and, and our tendency to underestimate how long things take in the, in, in still honor the conscious communication? Right. It's for me, it's about organization. Again, I'm a double Capricorn. I can't help it. <laughs> But it is about organization. And when I was first starting my career, it, it, it's old school. I, I still write in a notebook. Many people don't, but I do. And when I am, and especially this week, when things are starting to, you're feeling like the building of tasks, I do a box and it's, it's you know, critical importance today, this week. And just being able to get that down on paper gives me a sigh of relief because now I've got a game plan and I will many times I will turn my email off or my phone when I'm in the office or working is usually on silent. Um, I will get those critical things done right away because the important things don't have such a timeline on them. And then that's the same with depending on who you're speaking to, like if it is a client, in, in the PR world, and, and there's a couple of publicists, uh, Tammy, that are on, we have a tendency to over deliver because of the way our projects are structured. So it's this balance of keeping the client realistic of what you can do. And, that, and I'm gonna get into that with a little bit more of like conflict resolution of being really upfront about what your capabilities are. It's not a way of saying, I can't do it. It's a way of saying, this is what I do best. So that was kind of a roundabout answer for you, Dan, but did it kind of talk to some of the points that you're feeling? Yeah, you know, I think 
one thing I've learned is it's better to disappoint up front than to disappoint on the tail. So I'd rather disappoint you by saying, I know you wanted it tomorrow, but I can't get it to you before Friday versus saying, okay, okay, I'll get it done for you tomorrow. And then you don't get it done until Friday. And so um, I, I think I've learned to just swallow my decision, my, my desire to please and front end the disappointment, so to speak, or the setting of expectations. And what I've found magically is people don't tend to be upset at you if you do that. They, they almost always accept whatever boundaries you give them, they accept them and adapt. Where you really screw people up is when you promise something and then miss the deadline and don't deliver because they were counting on it. Um, so anyway, the other thing, and this is somewhat related, but I have a terrible tendency to underestimate how long things take me. And so I bought this little cube and whatever face it's on is the thing I'm doing. And then you can kind of customize it. Sales. That is fantastic. Marketing. It's called Timular. And there's a little software on my... So the, the page that I'm on here says yeah. practice being present. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, so, you know, you, you, if I just do this for like a day or two to reset these are my priorities and look at how much time I'm doing on non priorities. And also this is how long that task took. Uh, anyway, it's, it's called Timular. It's by a manufacturer called Z E I. Um, I recommend them. It's how I handle trying to be more present about my time. So I don't communicate poorly and erode important relationships because if you're ultimately your time is not your own. Uh, it belongs to your family, it belongs to your partners, it belongs to your clients. And so if you're bad at estimating time or uh, meeting deadlines, that has a huge impact on your credibility and your relationships. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that is a perfect segue into practice being present uh, and, and being present and focused. And then that leads into trying not to multitask so many things because then you're gonna have mistakes. Your mind is divided between these tasks. And so it's only natural that you might make a mistake. Uh, it adds stress to our daily lives. Uh, a Stanford University uh, survey showed that multitasking negatively affects our mood and motivation and productivity, which is really important um, and inhibits our creativity. So for so many of you that are on that are, are creatives, when you are trying to do too many tasks at once, you never have what I love, they said, working memory left to come up with the ideas and concepts that are truly creative. So that also is going back to active listening. I just want to make one more point and then we'll roll into conflict. But, and this is what we were taught as children try not to interrupt others in an important conversation. You really want to hear what they have to say. Helen, just kidding. That, what? <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I had to do it. I know, I, that was actually more of like a fishing line for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know me, we've been friends for so long. Sorry, back to you. Not at all, not at all, but I've, uh, many times, especially with friends, like when I haven't talked to a friend for a while on the phone or you haven't seen them, I sit back and listen because I want to hear what they have to say. And so this could be personal and business. When a client is upset about something, you really want to hear what they have to say. You don't want to be in your defensive mode of trying to tell them how none of this happened. Listen to what they have to say because that also kicks in, we'll talk about this in conflict resolution. It kicks in a different channel of finding a, a really productive resolution because you listen to what they said. So we're gonna move on to that, which is, is one of the most important things I feel. But going back to practicing being present, this week you're taking a phone call, don't organize your house, I'm guilty, you know, 
don't empty the dishwasher, don't watch TV, like practice actively listening to what they have to say. And that's gonna, as they say, practice makes perfect. Like the more that you practice these really simple things that, that we learned throughout our entire livelihood, uh, it's gonna come easier and it's gonna be more instinctive to listen versus formulating a response or calling someone off, off the cuff on a project that you're frustrated with. You know, go back to that intentional communication of what do you want out of this? What is the best path forward before you have that conversation? So that's, I like to say this equation. So I'm going into conflict resolution, Dan. Um, it's, it's the, you know, one plus one equals two. So intentional communication plus active listening are really going to get you further than you expect. Um, I'm just looking at comments and anything tip for managing time tasks. Yeah, there, there are so many apps that you can find depending on where you feel is, is the downfall of you managing time. Um, it depends on, on what you like. I, I'm a little bit, as I said, more old school and I will even put like a timeline to it. Okay, I'm going to be writing a press release because I can go down the rabbit hole with writing. And you rewrite and you rewrite and you rewrite. So, you know, for instance, one day I'll have to have three releases out, but I know that I'm also under the gun because it needs to get to media. So I'll put a time on it, like give myself an hour, walk away from it, do something else, come back to it, give myself 30 minutes. And then that also helps the procrastination that a lot of us have. So how, whatever, you know, apps that you like, um, software that works for you, there's millions of them. But I think definitely putting a time frame on the project. And, and you know, there's a really interesting um, study I read years and years and years ago, and it really stuck with me. I'm sure you can Google it and find it online. It's a survey of where, when is your most creative time? Some people are really creative in the morning. Others are creative in the afternoon. For me, the mornings are getting everything ready so I can be productive. And I found that from 4 to 7 p.m. is my creative window. So those that don't, projects that don't have, that are writing projects that don't have a huge um, deadline, I'll wait. I'll put the form, you know, put my information down and then I'll write during 4 to 7. I don't know if it's the light or it's maybe email slows down, but it's a... Uh, Oh, someone said in, oh, is that you or Lilia uh, around 10 p.m.? So it's a, it's a cool survey that you can take on your own. And, and then you'll see yourself kind of like molding your day-to-day -day tasks, knowing when you are the most creative and when your organizational time is best used. And I'll, I'll look that up because I want to read it again. If I find it today, I'll send it to Dan and he'll send it out to everyone. Perfect. So going, going back to conflict resolution, uh, everything we just discussed, purpose, what do you need, what do you want the outcome to be, and essentially choose who you want to be in that moment. Get centered prior to the conversation. Avoid using the personal phrases as you're wrong or I'm right about this. Instead, I found it to be so much more productive to say, let's look at the goals. Let's go through these goals. Or the results show X, Y, and Z. Or I do understand you're frustrated. I hear you. I, I, I understand that you feel this way. And another very important childhood lesson that we've all probably had is don't use the word but either at the end of your sentence or at the beginning. You know, let's look at the goals. But you didn't perform the way I wanted. I tried to bring that out of every sentence structure and simple, but that immediately, you know, cues the defensiveness in the other. And it, it's a defensive tone when you're working and seeking uh, a solution that is productive, which is hopefully what we're all thinking. Um, other be empathetic. You know, regarding, don't, don't be an asshole. No one likes an asshole, especially right now. Like be empathetic. Uh, 
regardless of how intense the agreement a disagreement is, slow down, think before you speak. It also allows the other to process what you're saying instead of you just going, you know, through the hamster wheel of the same conversation over and over and you're reiterating thinking they're not getting it and you're just talking over their brain. So be really clear, be empathetic. And also, especially now, I mean, you don't know what the other person is going through. They might have family members that are sick. You know, they, they might have, have lost their entire income. So be really understanding and, and try to ask questions to be put in their shoes, understand their POV. It doesn't mean you have to agree, but active listening can dramatically create positive solutions. And, um, oh, thanks guys. I'm getting all this love in the chat from all my friends. Appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a client that I, I wanted to give a, a little shout out to and Deborah who works with me is on and, and she can attest to this. Uh, so I've been working with a restaurant group in Denver for almost 10 years and there are two brothers, uh, Japanese brothers, they opened Sushi Den 35 years ago, which was unheard of in a landlocked state. And then in the past 10 years, we've opened two additional restaurants side by side. So they created this little Japan in, in a historic neighborhood in Denver. And their third brother is in Southern Japan, goes to the fish market every day. They dry ice it and it gets to Denver in 24 hours. And they've been able to continue this type of pristine seafood throughout the pandemic because they were able to, to pivot to pickup. They decided they didn't want to do delivery, uh, but they would do patio pickup because they have a, pickup, uh, a patio, excuse me. And it was a monumental feat. I mean, they didn't have any software in place for online ordering. They were called, they were getting 200 orders a day. I, they got 250 orders on Mother's Day. It was insane. And they were calling people back. So as you can imagine, there was a lot of empathetic language that was needing to be created. And also you can imagine we had quite a few complaints. I would say 90 of them, 90% of them, especially on social, so thankful for all of their efforts, but then you do have, you know, the rotten eggs that had to wait 30 minutes or were asking why 15% or 18% gratuity was added. And it just, you know, you, I thought to myself, really, you're spending $250 on sushi and you don't want to give the chefs and you know, those that are braving coming to work every day, $15 or $20, like it, Again, take a deep breath, get centered, think about what you're needing to respond. And one of the owners, his name is Yasu, I've taken some big cues from his responses. He, he gets the, e the majority of the emails and he responds to every single one and he immediately apologizes, immediately. I, like, I'm terribly sorry, I am deeply sorry. He addresses the guest complaint directly. I'm so sorry that you waited for 30 minutes. Oh, I, I apologize that no one called you back for 30 minutes to confirm your order. Uh, and then he's really transparent about the hardships of the limited chefs. Mother's Day, we were so far behind. We couldn't, we just couldn't catch up for this. I'm deeply sorry. We had limited chefs, you know, our Aloha system didn't print five tickets out and we didn't get to them. So being empathetic, being transparent and trying to find a solution, we found it diffuses the conflict immediately. And nine times out of 10, the guest ends up apologizing for complaining, which was really cool to see. Um, you're getting a lot of love on the chat. I'm, I'll take care of um, monitoring Any, okay. it for you, okay. but we did have an important question uh, from Maria Daniela Machado. How do you keep calm and be assertive when the other party is being aggressive? Oof, I know it's tough, isn't it? It's so hard Great because question. our first instinct is to, to fight back and, and to not, and for some it might be wanting to, to be strong and not, and perhaps this person is really malicious 
and they're, they're, they're hitting all your, their, your buttons. They know your buttons. And so they're hitting them. Again, a lot of deep breaths help me. I, I don't respond. I just let them get it out. Uh, and then going back to, and this actually, we we're just going to get to this of being, um, don't be emotional, be factual because um, facts always trump emotion. So if you can go back to all of your professional training and if you are in the wrong, say so and say, you're, yes, I completely understand where you're coming from. Yes, this happened and being transparent and then trying to come up with a positive solution to the situation um, usually works. But again, it, dep it depends on what your audience is. Um, if you know that you're going to need to have a hard conversation <laughs> with someone, as they say, timing is everything. So if you're in control of when you need to have this conversation or meeting, you know, don't, it's really not a good idea to bring up difficult subjects first thing in the morning. This person might have had a really hectic commute, or they might not have had coffee, or, you know, their child was sick and they're not halfway dressed yet, but they still pick up the phone. Uh, or having a sensitive conversation right before a meal. <laughs> we all know what happens when you have low blood sugar. Or walking into someone's office when you know they have to be out the door at 5.30 or calling them at 5 when you, you know that, you know, they're about to now start working with the kids or getting dinner ready. Try to be really cognizant of your timing of when you're having these conversations. My, my yeah. wife calls it door knobbing. Uh, door knobbing is when somebody's at the door about to leave and you like bring up some uh, yes. topic. That's like my worst like bad habit because I don't want them to leave. So I'm like, oh, by the way, did I tell you? Uh, you know, I'm in stage four cancer. Uh, oh, you have to go? Right, right, exactly, exactly. And that on that point, also try not to bring up other issues in the heat of the moment. I mean, it, it, you'll never win. Again, what, why do you need to win this conversation? What does winning look like? Is it a solution? Usually not. It's more of taking deep breath, <laughs> sitting back, listening to the other person, scheduling good time, because this in itself conveys mutual respect and sets the stage for a productive conversation. And even when you have a call that's scheduled and you pick up the phone, you call, you know, I'm calling Dan at 1230. Hey, how are you? Just want to see, is this still a good time for you? Because you never know what has happened. You know, they, they might have had something pop up five minutes before. And they, again, Dan, you know, you want to take the call. But um, I always ask, is this still a good time? And it just, it allows them to say no, usually. If it's not a good time, we'll call you back. No big deal. So I, I, um, I, I want to say that I love the idea of not trying to win a conversation. That is almost a guaranteed way to lose, um, especially if you're dominant or smarter or have more power than the other person. The best way to lose a conversation is to try to win it. Um, I did want to also just do a time check. I know you have a couple great case studies. Um, yeah. Are, are, um, we can skip the one you did on, on BizHack, but maybe we could do Stacy. Yes, let's do Stacy, uh, which I don't think she's on, but I see that her colleagues, Matt and Jennifer, were on. I think they're still on. Yeah, they are. So you can report back to her. But for all of us that know Stacy, she might be one of the most conscious people that we know. And it's, it's not just about her words, it's about her engagement, the way she engages with you and makes you feel that she is listening to every single word you have to say, and she's really absorbing it. And she's in your corner. So um, she is now uh, the VP of development at National Young Arts Foundation. And for those of you who are not familiar with Young Arts, it's extraordinary. And it was founded 30 plus years ago by the Arisons. 
and it identifies the most accomplished young artists in visual, literary, performing arts, and then also very much like New World, provides them with creative and professional development opportunities throughout their careers. So the, the talent that has come through young arts are the creme de la creme. Stacy is in charge of development and also working with the really high dollar categories. So she has two divisions, one that's 15,000 to 99,000 and then annual gifts of 1,000 and above. These are not easy conversations to have. Hi, how are you? Do you want to give me $100,000? <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, so I, I got caught up with her the other week because she was the first person I thought of, of like, what case studies do I want to present? And I was like, this will probably resonate with many of us. Um, her conscious communication and the tools that I'm, I'm going to go through a few more than are on the slide, but what is the most important and, you know, bravo to Stacy. she exceeded her budget goal six months before deadline. Six months. She did it in half a year versus the, the fiscal year that they have. And her advice was communicate from your higher self. And if anyone knows Stacy, this, you can totally hear her say that. Your higher self, what does that mean? For her, she gets grounded and centered before calls and meetings. You know, she'll get up early. She's got two young children. Um, she'll get up early. She'll go, take a boardwalk. She'll roll her yoga mat out to the deck. For you, it could be getting up and walking around the house or going down the stairs or walking outside for a minute and just being. That, for me, I need to move. So I did a dance class this morning because I had to get like all this all this energy out. So uh, for her, she gets really grounded before calls and meetings. And she develops, which takes time, but she develops really authentic relationships. Uh, for instance, when I talked to her that day, she had 100 emails to send. And she was taking the time to write each email individually to this person and peppering it with uh, anecdotes or personal knowledge, like, hi, you know, I understand your kids are home. How are you? You know, whatever it may be. She was taking the time that day to write a hundred personal emails. That for me is a perfect example of intentional communication. Be clear. She, this is her voice. She said, be clear in what I want and have confidence in what I'm asking for. And then her active listening example was don't over talk and let them answer the question that you're asking. And then her conflict resolution example was being okay with no, which is a hard word to hear, especially when you're trying to meet financial goals. But she keeps the door open and was like, okay, I, I completely understand. Thank you for telling me that. We have some very exciting things that are coming up, especially now that they've shifted into these incredible virtual uh, performances and I know that whole team is working so hard to shift into this new normal but she shared with me that she'll ask can I send you some information next month there's something you might be really interested in because then it opens the door for being able to have another hard conversation but they might be in a different place next month so that was really inspiring to me and I thought for all of us that are on today, there might be a little nugget here and there that you can use when, when asking, when doing the hard ask. Uh, Dan, I do wanna shift to yours really quick. We'll do, because I love this phrase that you said when we were talking. For you, the cell, the no cell was the cell, or the cell was the no cell, vice versa. It means the same thing. So you decided to, instead of launching this 12 week course, which you were gonna launch in April, it wasn't realistic. So you shifted your game plan to convene with alumni and present how you, they're adapting in the new normal during COVID-19. And then what started as this mini show that you were going to do about conscious marketing is now a weekly series. And here we are. And your stats, I do, feel are really significant. You know, you have an average of 100 plus weekly participants. 
Uh, some weeks are better than others, but what, as we all know, especially those that live in Miami, where you RSVP for everything and you don't show up, Dan and BizHack are getting 70% of RSVPs, which is bravo. It's amazing. But I think it's also where we are right now. We're in a very conscious place. We want to learn more about communication and listening and how to shift our businesses. And, and it's for what you have done and what your learnings have been, you know, thirst for programming. You've been coming back from a place of give back, not a sales piece, your honesty, your, your vulnerability. You've seen that because now you have an option where if you want to donate, and several of my friends did, thank you very much, you're seeing that people are donating week after week to be able to share all of our appreciation. So one last case study, which I'll present, and then we're going to wrap it up. Um, how are we? We're at 131. Do you want me to go through the VW real quick? Yeah, people will stick with us. And if you have okay. to go, if they have to go, I, that we understand. But this, this, this is so rich uh, and so valuable. I don't want to cut you short. Please, please continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, so, thanks, uh, and thanks, by the way, for, for what you said about what we're doing. Oh, like, of course. Yeah. Of course. Again, you know, we're all in it together. And it's, it's tribe and community. Uh, so my third case study is about Volkswagen and the emissions scandal that they went through. I believe it was 2016. Um, I'm an Audi driver and I've been an Audi driver since I was in college. And there's something about Audi, Volkswagen, there's this culture that they have that is about trust, integrity, reliability. And so for this emissions scandal, to to happen was just i mean that it's amazing the company did not go down in flames and reading i was really digging into this the the scandal also really rocked their employees because their employees have always been such rich ambassadors for the brand and have always felt they were taken care of and then taken they take care of vw so they have uh, their CEO, his name is Matthias Mueller, worked uh, on the strategy that was four keywords, replace, restructure, redevelop, and rebrand. So he started with personnel first. Uh, he wanted to regain the favor of this demoralized staff. And he employed a strategy of openness and outreach. And I, I have a link to this that I can share. I don't want to get too deep into it. But one thing that I loved was he, um, he really tried to change the, cult, the culture from within. He looked around and he saw, you know, the female percentage of managerial was 3%. Uh, there wasn't as much diversity as he would like to have. So he really shook up. The, his hiring practices and also who was performing within the company. Uh, he employed a strategy of openness and outreach. He asked employees to report directly back to him and share their experiences and ideas and how they feel they could get past this crisis. Um, they also publicly admitted guilt. So this goes back to transparency. They admitted guilt in all of their external communications and it might not have been at the beginning, but they did. And I think that resonated with many that uh, were either going to purchase VW or were driving VW. Um, and they had the same direct face-to-face -face conscious communications internally. So what I found was the company's internal moral boosting efforts paid it forward. It increased an outward positive effect. And in the following years, the general public opinion seems to have recovered. And on the business front, VW, VW's earnings outpaced forecasts. So I think that, that really shows where you have an intentional plan and you're transparent and you, you learn from your mistakes and apply that to your conflict resolution. I mean, if VW can come back from this, I think we all can definitely come back from some of the crisis that we're enduring. So here's your takeaway. For those that are just starting to gear back up, 
or have lost clients and you don't know if they are going to come back, these are really easy practices that you can use for really anyone. You know, stay in conversations, friendly check-ins, call, email, just ask how they are. Don't ask for something back, just ask how they are. Um, we like to send a lot of news. We keep a constant audit of news. And so we're, we're sending, you know, the mayor's remarks or the governor's remarks or, you know, what's the latest with restaurant openings. So be of service with industry news and just once a week with a, maybe it's a, a client that you really want to bring back or it's a client you're pursuing, be of service with industry news. Uh, please don't start out conversation with the overused phrases. These unprecedented times, yes, we know. We're all here. We're here. Um, during this crazy time, we know. <laughs> we know. You don't need to state the obvious. Um, and you can also offer tailored communication. Maybe it's crisis management. Maybe it's just them needing to have uh, an announcement of how they're opening up. You know, ask them, say, how are you? Do you need anything? Uh, how are you speaking to the media? How are you speaking to your employees? Can I help you? And then sometimes you just got to put your therapist hat on and just listen. And that I found really is not only helpful of again, going back and understanding their POV, but understanding how you personally can advance positive solutions for them. Any, any questions on chat that I need to no, go back over? Um, you know, Cirilla uh, asked a really good question, uh, but I honestly think that you really answered it in your slide, okay. which is how to communicate with customers that are having a hard time in the hospitality industry. Um, you know, the one thing I'll tell you, when I'm being asked about marketing, um, sometimes I'm just like, boy, that really is a tough one. Like if you're a mall, and you're shut down, uh, you know, like I generally say, like be in regular touch with your clients, you know, be in regular touch with your, um, your businesses, uh, you know, help out your tenants as much as they can so they can survive this because it's more expensive for you to fill uh, an empty retail space than for you to keep them, even if it means abating the rent or giving them a break or giving them better payment terms. Um, you know, I think in the end, um, the, um, there are some industry, this is, you know, uh, Bruce Turkel has this kind of provocative phrase, we are not in this together. And what he really is saying is some of us have sick family members, some of us are ourselves sick, some of us have businesses that are thriving, many of us have businesses that are struggling and suffering and have no path forward. And um, some of us are unemployed. Uh, and are scared as hell. Some of us are running out of money. Some of us don't have enough food. So no, we're, we're not all in this together. We're all experiencing the storm differently. Or we're in different boats, but the same storm. And so um, be conscious of that, that you, know, you may be privileged in simple ways that you're healthy and you have family support and some money saved. Uh, you may be struggling more than others. And as long as you are humane and human in your conversations. One habit I've started to build is whenever I talk to someone, I say, I'd like to just talk to you human to human, you know, before we talk about the course or before we talk about your business. I, how are you? How is your family? Is there anything I can do to help? And then, okay, let's talk about, is this five week course a good fit? And I don't know, it's made the sales conversations much more pleasant. I, I haven't necessarily sold more, but I think people appreciate that they're not being treated like a number. Be human. We are human. Why, why, we must continue to be human. Uh, and, you know, just as we've seen, I was listening to NPR this morning, you know, how they're, they're, we've seen fish swimming in the Venice canals and we, you know, the air quality in Shanghai, like we have seen such a shift in, in everything that if we're able to keep that positivity within ourselves, just think how many people you can shift as well with positive conscious communication. You can really shift the way that you get to a solution or you get to a conversation. And I saw someone posted really funny, where was it about um, 
when we were talking of having an argument with uh, someone and they're really coming at you. Uh, oh, it was Anthony. Never argue with a fool. Onlookers may not be able to tell the difference. Great. That is a pearl of wisdom. <laughs> That's Anthony, awesome. Anthony is filled with them. He's an inspirational speaker, so he's got lots of them. Um, yeah. So we'll want to wrap up, but you have a special offer that we shouldn't obscure uh, your offering. Sure, 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 sure. So um, what I want to extend to uh, our BizHack members are uh, if you, I have three sessions that I break out, which was going to, as I was talking at the beginning of how I was going to start these master level uh, communications courses. So it's broken out into three. It's verbal communication. So what we went over with this hour and change, which can also be applied to written for all of you who are, again, you know, needing to possibly, are you needing to put resumes out? Are you needing to do cover letters? Are you needing to do new bios? Are you needing to do new company profiles and fact sheets and anything in creative materials? Uh, I'm happy to extend a 30 minute session for any of these. And then public speaking, which, uh, you know, so many of us, I know I'm at the beginning in March, I really didn't want to get on Zoom. It was scary. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't sure if I, I, I felt so vulnerable. So if there's uh, anyone that needs just, you know, some quick tips on how to speak to, an employer, maybe you're needing to do a virtual conference, maybe you're actually needing to speak to media. Uh, I have a, a, a checklist that we can go through. And these are complimentary 30 minute sessions. Um, just shoot me an email at info at ellenmarchman.com and we'll dig in. We'll um, create some blueprints. And then if it's something that you might want to continue uh, on my website, you can go on and see um, what the different courses look like. And then we can talk further. But um, it would be, I, I'm so thankful and grateful for all these amazing uh, comments on chat. I'm really, I'm so thankful that this was helpful for you. It was helpful for me, <laughs> but I'm really, I, I, that means a lot. All of your remarks are just so positive and uh, I, I really appreciate your time. Good. Well, uh, to all the friends of Ellen out there, uh, send along your love in the chat. Uh, I'm going to just quickly wrap up um, reminding folks that we have uh, a series of amazing sessions coming up. Uh, we're going to have a session on SEO tomorrow. Uh, we're going to have uh, a session on building your tribe next Wednesday at 1230 in our normal time slot. In two weeks, we're going to talk about Instagram stories 101. And in three weeks, we're going to be, I'm going to be doing a session on how to identify your target audience in Facebook. So um, with that, um, I just wanted to say thank you, Ellen, uh, for doing this. Thanks to Ellen's dad for <laughs> the love and support and making such an Thanks, amazing Pops. daughter. <laughs> is that you right there? Is that him? It is. Oh, he turned on his camera to say hi. You want to <laughs> unmute for a sec and talk about what it was like to raise a girl like Ellen? Oh, gosh, <laughs> Dad. <laughs> Come on, do it, Dad. Let me unmute you. It's been a real pleasure having a daughter like Ellen. She's uh, been always a little bit on the edge of trying to keep in line, but <laughs> been very successful in what she's doing. And I'm very, very proud to have her as a daughter. She's just uh, got the sweetest personality and love for everyone. And I couldn't be more thankful. So I think you did a great job, my daughter. Proud uh, oh, going to get teary, dad. <laughs> thank well, you for sharing thank you. Herb. thank you and here's luna hi hi luna <laughs> <laughs> all uh, right guys well you know have a great day go kill it let me know if you have more questions and shoot me an email i'm happy to you know jump on the phone with you or do a video chat whatever you need all right and my light just went out so it's time to wrap up Time to go. <laughs> Bye, Herb. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ellen. Bye. We'll be in touch. See you next week. All right. Or tomorrow. Or tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care. Bye, everybody.